That was a cool video. That's a good intro we're going to talk about today. As you see, kind of a visual of, of what it looks like. If you go with, to Israel with us, you'll see the Bedouin shepherds out there as they're out there tending their flock, just as they did in Bible times. But this is good stuff right here. Open your Bibles to John chapter 10. So we look at this wonderful passage of uh, the sheep and the shepherd and how this all works together. John chapter 10. All right, we're doing a series here at Calvary, uh, a series on the life of Jesus. And our study has landed us here in John chapter 10. All right, so John chapter 10. So before that, what we were talking about, we're looking at this story, again, tracking with the life of Jesus. We're looking at this story of Jesus that had, um, had healed, a man, healed a man that was born blind. And you'd think that everyone would celebrate that. It, definitely his family, his friends did. You'd think those that were following God, supposedly following God, would have rejoiced. I mean, here's a man that has been in turmoil, born blind, had never seen, and now he's seeing the joy of that moment. You'd think they would have rejoiced with him, but they didn't. And we, we were reading the story last time, is this, is they were upset because he didn't do it on the Sabbath day. He didn't follow our little rules and regulations. Those rules and regulations was never set down by God for them to take it as far as they did. The Sabbath was to be a blessing. And again, we already talked about this. That was to be a blessing. We do need rest. Our physical bodies need rest. Our spirits need to, need to get away from the busyness of this life and focus on the things of God. It was to be a blessing. They turned it into this curse to where now here's all the things you can and cannot do. Some legalistic head trip that, that was put on them. And that's what we do as Christians sometimes. We put legalistic head trips on people. And really the bottom line is this. God wants you to love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and love each other. That fulfills the whole thing. Because when you love him, you love the things that he loves. It's easy to, it's easy to love him. It's hard to love you. Uh, that's true. But when I really love him, it makes it easier loving you. And that's so true. And then I love his word. I love his church. I love the things that God loves. He's, he changes our lives. Well, this guy was thrown out of their religious circles. He was excommunicated. Now, that's serious in Bible days. You get excommunicated, you're, you can be thrown out of the community. It's a bad thing uh, that they were trying to do to him. But Jesus went and found him. And this is all the context for what we're going to talk about today. Because as he found them, he found him and began to encourage him, do you believe in the Son of God? And he said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said in verse 37 of the previous cha of, of chapter 9, he said, uh, it says, you have both seen him. You're looking, you've seen him. That's, you haven't seen many people, but you're seeing him now. And it is him who is talking with you. Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. And there's a relationship that was there. The religious leaders are looking on, they're upset with him. And then Jesus gets into this dialogue about family, that this is what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. Um, and let me just read it. He says, he says, most assuredly I say to you, look at verse one of chapter 10, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up another way, the same as a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the door keeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him and they know him and it goes on there. And so this man is listening, the religious leader is listening and he's talking about this is what a relationship looks like. A relationship with God looks like well, it looks like these sheep and the shepherd, and now they had been familiar with that. It's really cool to have that video before we start, because that's what you see in Israel. You do see the, the sheep and the shepherd, and they're interacting together. If he was in Texas, he would say, I want you to consider the cowboy and his horse. 
you know, it was something that they had been familiar with. Or in, in Southern California, it would have been, I want you to notice the surfboard and the surfer dude. Or in Utah, it would be, I want you to notice the man and his wives. Okay? <laughs> whatever okay so but it is just, it's this it's really just this is this is what they would have been used to they would have understood these these this relationship between and you see again you cannot go to Israel without seeing the the sheep that's there and the shepherd and they're interacting again one of the cool things we'll do this year is that we'll go to Bethlehem and you'll be able to see some of the some of the, the shepherds and as we come out of Jericho going to Jerusalem that whole desert area is just it's just a Bedouin it's Bedouin shepherd cities out there and there's times that we've we've actually went a couple three trips back we went and spent some time with some of the Bedouins and got to know some of them and, and learning their customs and sat in their tent for an afternoon and talked to them about their customs and things and, and learned a lot about shepherds and sheep and, the, and the, this, whole, this whole culture of these Bedouin shepherds, as they're called, these, these nomad, these shepherds that they would travel. And, and so Jesus is drawing that. This is a common sight something that they were familiar with. David was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. You have uh, Job had, uh, had 14,000 sheep. He was a shepherd, uh, the Bible says, and, and it goes on there. So he's saying, look, I want to tell you about a relationship with God. This is what it looks like. It looks like the sheep and the shepherd. And he says this, I say to you that he who does not enter by the sheepfold uh, by the door, but climbs in another way, the same as a thief and a robber. Now in that, you're able to see a little bit in the video to see that these sheep pens, these sheep pens have one door. And this is where the, the, the shepherd will, will herd all the sheep into this, this sheep pen for the night. And then he will literally, and we'll see this, Jesus is going to use this analogy in verse 7, I am the door of the sheep. And the shepherd will literally lay across that doorway so that the predators can't get in. They'll have to come over him or the sheep can't wander off. So he's the door, and there's only, now this is important to understand, this is basic Christianity right here, there's only one way, there's only one door. To come into the sheep pen, there's only one way. To come into a relationship with God, there's only one way. It's through what Jesus Christ has done upon that cross. It's only through him. There is, listen guys, listen to this well, because this is not a, this is not a, a, a correct, statement for the world today. It's becoming less and less when we say, look, there is only one way to heaven, and that's through what Jesus Christ has done upon that cross. The world hears that and goes, well, you Christians are just so narrow. What about all the other faiths? What about all the other religions? And I believe this, if people will seek God, truly seek him in spirit and truth, I want to know God, and I want to know the truth, they'll run right into Jesus every time, every time. And there's evidence and there's, there's uh, testimony after testimony of those in, in completely in, in countries where there was no gospel. Completely, it was all Islamic. And you hear the stories of the person that began to really cry out and want to know, I really want to know you, God. And they had, they had an encounter with Jesus. How does that work? I don't know. God's a big God. My God's a big God and he can reach people. And I don't worry, what about that person that never heard? What I, I don't worry about that. I let God worry about that. You ought to worry about you and make sure you know him. That's the thing. But, but you need to understand there's only one way. Only one way. It says in Psalms 1, uh, 143, it says this. It says, for in your sight, no one living is righteous. In Romans 3, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Basic Christianity is this, is that you are separated from God. Your sins have separated you from God, and there is only one way to bridge that gap between you and God, and that's through what Jesus Christ has done. And praise God, he made it easy that we simply need to come to him in faith, and in that, he changes us. I praise God he didn't make it. If he made it hard, I wouldn't be able to do it. If he made it difficult, I couldn't do it. In the early days, if he said, I need you to go to church five times a week, I need you to read your Bible every day, all of it. If he put some of those things down, I couldn't do it. I wouldn't have done it. But what did he do? He said, I want you to do this. I want you to follow me. 
And that's going to be all about in this section we're looking at. I want you to follow me. I can do that. But I'm going to have to learn your voice. I'm going to have to learn what it's about. I, I've got to, and so, yeah, so where do I start? Right here, getting into the Bible and reading the Bible, getting to know the shepherd, getting to know him. Our sins have separated us from God. You got to understand, you can't save yourself. And Proverbs says, it says, no one can say, I have made my heart clean. I am pure from my sins. You can't save yourself. No human being can save you. Psalm 49 says this, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. You cannot save yourself. No one can save you outside of what Jesus has done. But I understand, I want you to listen to this. I understand what Paul said, and I, I feel this a lot. He says this in 2 Corinthians. He says, now then, we are ambassadors of Christ as though through God we are pleading. He is pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Now this is what he said. We're imploring you. We're begging you on Christ's behalf. 2 Corinthians 5, he said, be reconciled to God. So I'm pleading with you. Be reconciled to God. Know God. And when Paul says that, I can understand what he's saying. Pleading with you. Know God. Know the shepherd. Have a relationship with him. He loves you so much. Lord, help us to hear and help us to heed. But you've got to understand there's only one way. Only one way. Notice what else he says here. He says, but he who enters by the door, look at verse 2, is the, is the shepherd of the sheep. Verse 3, to him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep, here it is, hear his voice. We hear his voice. Look at verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Again, it was kind of cool watching the shepherd, you know, you know that sound he was making? I can't even do it well. You try it. Hey. Good job. Good job. But it's kind of cool to hear, to hear the different shepherds out there, and they have this little, little sound that they make, and it's all unique to the various shepherds. They'll make this kind of, kind of sound, and, and you'll see them uh, throwing rocks, too. It's, it's cool. As the, shep as the sheep will begin to wander off, um, they'll take rocks, and they'll throw rocks to kind of shoo them away from various areas. In fact, that's how the Dead Sea Scrolls, remember, the Dead, you know the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's how they were found. It was a Bedouin shepherd out there in the 1940s was out there, and he's throwing rocks, and he's kind of keeping his sheep together, and he goes over. There's a cave opening up there, and he's gotten real good at throwing rocks, and he throws a rock through there. Whew. And when, when, the, when, the, when the rock goes through there, he hears um, a jar breaking. He hears the sound of pottery breaking. They don't go in right away. They go in, he goes, gets... Uh, his cousin, they go in later, and they go in. That's the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Out there where the shepherds are at, throwing their rocks out there. You know, I was sitting out there and, uh, and watching these sheep and, and these goats out there. In one of the, and this was in Bethlehem. And I'm sitting out there, and the shepherd's out there, and he's moving all the sheep around. I'm, I'm sitting there, and here comes the sheep. And the sheep walks up to me, and I thought he was going to pet this thing. It's kind of, hey, that's a cool looking sheep. And I, he came up, and, and it's like smelling my leg. And I go, okay, what is this about? And the thing went, and I bit my leg. <laughs> and I go, bing, right on the top of the head. And that shepherd is just laughing. Yeah, that thing will bite you, man. And look, there's a big, greasy, fat guy. Let's see what he tastes like. <laughs> you know? uh, thing is this, is that it says here, the sheep hear his voice. The sheep hear his voice. Practice the presence of God. How do I know that, I, that that was God that was, that, that, is that my own desires? How can I tell the difference between my own desires and God's voice and, and the enemy, the devil? How can I tell the difference between? Practice his presence. Let me tell you this. He will never, ever, ever contradict his word. 90% of the time he's going to speak to you one way. That's through the Bible. But there is times in the prompting of that still small voice that God will, will speak to you. I remember a story that uh, a pastor told, Pastor Chuck Smith told this story about his grandkid and his uh, interaction between his grandkid and his, and his daughter-in-law. And, and uh, the grandkid said, you know, Mom, I've heard, uh, I've heard you and Grandpa talk a lot about hearing God's voice. I don't think I hear God's voice very well. I don't think I've ever heard God's voice 
just go to sleep, go to sleep. And, and no, mom, I, I want to know. I, I don't think I hear God's voice. So do, do you remember, do you remember when you were out in the garage with your dad's golf clubs? Yeah. Do you remember that little small voice that said you shouldn't be swinging that golf club in the garage? Yeah. Right before, you know what happened? Yeah. That's the voice of God. The kid gets real quiet for a minute and the kid says, mom, I think I hear God's voice a lot. You know? <laughs> I think I hear God's voice a lot. I think that God does speak to us a lot more than we understand. But I do know this. Take time listening. Well, I don't know how to go. It was a home, speak to me, God. Hum. Is that? No, 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 that's not it. Let me tell you how it is. It's right here in his word. In his word, listening for his voice. Lord, speak. You open the Bible. Lord, speak to me. I want to hear your voice. Lord, I want to walk with you. I want to do right. I want to hear your voice. And he shows up. This is not just some history book that we're studying. The Bible says of itself, it's alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts right down through the soul, to the heart, to the marrow. It cuts right down to our souls. And that is absolutely true. As you begin to read, it begins to speak to you. There's things that you begin to see. So many times I've opened the Bible and it's been a passage I'm familiar with and I begin to look and God begins to say something directly to me through that. Love that. I don't know how to describe that. All I can say is, is, is well, again, what so many have said in the past. Taste and see for the Lord, he is good. You've got to experience this. I can tell you what it's like, but you're going to go, well, that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It does when you taste and see. It's like describing something that you're eating. It's like, you know, it's kind of salty and yet it's got a little bite to it you know and you, you try to it, it doesn't matter until you taste it and you go oh now i see what you're trying to describe that's the word of god that's following god so when he says for us that follow him it says the sheep hear his voice uh, we we read that and go yeah we do hear his voice i've heard him speak to me through his word and i'm still learning i've been doing this for a long time i'm still learning to 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 say, okay, that was me, or that was my own desires. That was God's voice. And notice what it says, we're in verse three. It says, second part, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. He calls you by name. He knows you. He knows the things you struggle with. He knows the sins that you think nobody knows. Yes, I said sins, plural. You're a sinner, and you need Christ. You need him to help you, and you need to say no to sin. I know, because you guys come in for counseling. Sometimes just back-to-back -back counseling comes in. Pastor John's a saint, okay? I mean, he sits there and listens to all that counseling. I just tell you, hey, you know what? Get right with God. Stop being a... You ever see this? this is, I wish I had this video. This is cool. Bob Newhart. You ever heard Bob Newhart? Bob Newhart did a thing. Go, go to YouTube and watch this, where he's counseling a person. Uh, Dr. Switzer? Uh, yes, C come in. I'm just, just washing my hands. Uh, I'm Catherine Bigman. Janet Carlisle referred me. Oh, yes. Uh, still being a very delight in the box. Yes, yes, that's me. <laughs> Should I lay down? Oh, no, no, no. We don't, we don't do that anymore. Just, just have a seat. And uh, let, let me uh, tell you a, a bit about our, our billing. I, um, I charge $5 for the, for the first five minutes. And, and then absolutely nothing after that. How, how, how does that sound? <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> Too good to be true, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, I can I can almost guarantee you that that our session won't last the full uh, the full five minutes. Now, um, <laughs> we don't do any insurance billing, so you would either have to pay in in cash or by check. <clears throat> wow. Okay. And uh, and I I don't make change. All right. <laughs> and go. <laughs> go. Well, tell what? me, tell me about the problem that you wish to address. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I have this fear of being buried alive in a box. <laughs> I just, I start thinking about being buried alive, and I begin to panic. Has, has, has anyone ever, ever tried to, to bury you alive in a box? No. 
No, but truly thinking about it does make my life horrible. I mean, I can't go through tunnels or be in an elevator or in a house, anything boxy. So what, what you're saying is you're, uh, you're claustrophobic. Uh, yes. Yes, that's it. All right. Well, uh, let's go, Catherine. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Shall I uh, write them down? Well, it, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most, we find most people can, uh, can remember them. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. Okay, here, here they are. Stop it! <laughs> I'm sorry? Stop it! Stop it? Yes, S-T-O-P, new word, I-T. So, what are you saying? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I, I, I say two simple words, and I cannot tell you the amount of people who say exactly the same thing you're saying. I mean, this, you know, this is not Yiddish, Catherine. This is English. Stop it. So, I should just stop it. There you go. I mean, you, you, you don't want to go through life being scared of being buried alive in a box, do you? I mean, that sounds, sounds frightening. <laughs> yes. Then stop it. I, I can't. I mean, it's been with me no, since no, childhood. No, no, no. No, we, 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 we don't go there. Just, just stop it. So I should just stop being afraid of being buried alive in a box. You got it. Good girl. Well, it's only been, it's only been three minutes, so that will be um, uh, three dollars. Uh, actually, I only have a five. So. Well, I, I, don't, I don't make change. Then I, I guess I'll take the full five minutes. Fine. All right. Well, what other uh, problems would you, would you like to address? <clears throat> Whew. Uh, I'm bulimic. I stick my fingers down my throat. Stop it! <laughs> Not of some kind? Don't, don't do that. But I, I'm compelled to. My mom used to call me... No, 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 no. No, we, we don't go there. But I've been having this dream. No, we don't go there either. But my horoscope did say... We definitely don't go there. Just, <laughs> just stop it! What, what, what else? Well, I have self-destructive relationships with men. Stop it! <laughs> you, you want to be with a man, don't you? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yes. Well, then stop it! <laughs> don't be such a... Big baby. I wash my hands a lot. That's all right. It is? I, I wash my hands all the time. There's a lot of germs out there. Uh -huh. Yeah, don't, don't, uh, don't worry about that one. I'm afraid to drive. Well, stop it! I mean, how, how are you going to get around? Get in the car and drive, you, you kook. Stop it! You stop it! You stop it! What's, what's the problem, Catherine? I don't like this. I don't like this therapy at all. You're just telling me to stop it. And, and, you, and you, don't, you don't like that? No, I don't. So you think we're, we're moving too fast, is that it? Yes. Yes, I do. All right, then let me, uh, let me uh, give you ten words that I, I think will... Uh, clear everything up for you. Uh, you want to you want to get a pad and a pencil for this one. All right. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. All right. Here are the ten words. Stop it, or I'll bury you alive in a box. I like that. That's good counseling right there. That's good counseling. You don't need to say, oh, I'm so sad for you. Oh, poor baby, poor baby. No, stop it. Stop it. Get a helmet. Life is tough sometimes. All right? That's why I don't do it at counseling. <laughs>
I understand there's stuff that there's stuff that comes at us. I understand life is really hard sometimes. I understand all that. But I do know this, that God is great and God is powerful and God is mighty and God shows up in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our temptations. God always shows up and he's right there. And what is he saying? He's saying, do you hear my voice? Are you following me? Because I'm calling you by name. So every once in a while in that still small voice, I hear, Bubba. <laughs> Bubba. Now, if you're named Bubba, I'm sorry that they called you that. So, I do have relatives named Bubba. Um, called his sheep by name, and he leads them out. Verse 3, he leads them out. Leads them out of difficulties. He leads them out of, out of, out of uh, uh, harm's way. He leads them out. There is protection in that. In following Jesus, there is protection. In fact, he's going to say it better here uh, on that point. Look at verse 28. He says, well, look at verse 27. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall, any, now, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. Now, we'll deal with that later because we're going we're gonna to walk through that passage slowly. But I want you to see what he did here. He said, look, this is how secure you are when you're following the shepherd. This, this is the hand of Jesus. And he has you in his hand. Now, if that's not good enough for you, if that's, if that's not, well, can I wiggle out? Can I get out? If that's not good enough, it says the father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. So if that's not enough, you're also in the hand of God. So there's that two hand action. I love that because right here is the security of being in the presence of God and the nothing can come to me. Nothing can come to you unless it's filtered through the hands of God. Satan can't mess with me or you without permission from God. If you're God's property, you ever read the book of Job? Job had to get, per, Satan had to get permission before he could harass Job. And he says, well, of course Job serves you because you have blessed him. You pull your blessing away from him. He'll curse it to your face, God. And that's what Satan said. He says, well, go ahead. Go ahead, do it. Just don't kill him. Don't kill him. Now, I don't want God to ever say that about me. I won't make it, God. I'll mess up. I'll mess up bad. So please keep your protection on me. But there's others in this room, Lord, that they can handle that. And you can do that to them. And we can watch them and learn great things from them as they do that, Lord. But not, don't. I need your protection. And I see God has always been faithful to protect his kids always been. I mean, just consistently through the word. There's a man that it had never rained before on earth. It had never rained. And to read the Bible, it never rained. And God tells this, this man, a righteous man, the Bible says, tells this man, I want you to build this boat and I'm going to cause it to rain and I'm going to flood the earth. Rain? What's rain? What is that? What are you talking about? You're going to make it rain. And yet he trusted in God and began to build. And the neighbors were harassing him. What are you doing building this boat? You're, you're, you're not even near, no, you're not even near, get it out of, you got that thing in part of my driveway too. Get that thing out of the driveway. You'll get this huge boat that he's building. And all of a sudden, you think they would have got it when all the animals started coming. I said, wow, he's gonna build a zoo, a petting zoo. We'll bring the kids over there, get the grandkids over there. Maybe that's what he's doing. But then it would have been, all the laughter and all the jokes would have stopped whenever it says that God shut the door on the ark and it began to rain. It was too late. It was too late. I mean, I can't imagine the, the depth of sorrow it was for not only those outside and they were going to die and knowing that that was all that it was it for them, but also for those inside. That's their neighbors. But God has shut the door. It was too late. It's appointed on a man to die, and then the judgment. There's a judgment day coming. But I see God is consistent as he protects his people. I see it with Lot. I see God is, is, is stepping in. Now, this is a, a completely depraved area, Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah is depraved. But let me tell you, tells us in, um, tells us in Ezekiel, Tells us in Ezekiel one of the main reasons why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of their 
sexual immorality? That was part of the story, yes. You read the story in Genesis, part of the story. Why did he destroy them? Ezekiel tells us this. He destroyed them because they neglected the poor. A little line in there kind of makes you back up a little bit. What? It's because they did not take care of the poor. Hmm. What should we be about? What does God care about? But the thing is this, is that Lot was there. Righteous Lot, it says. Righteous. Lot was really messed up. Read the story. He was messed up. But God says, this is righteous Lot. We're going to get him out here and his family out here. Some of the family wouldn't go. We're going to take the family out. Because the angel said this. says, we can do nothing until we get you out of here. We can't. The judgment's not going to fall until you are safely out. I see God consistent. I can tell you story after story after story in the Bible. You got Daniel in the lion's den. You got Daniel, lions, hungry. Right? We know they're hungry because others are going to get thrown in after Daniel and they're going to die. Right? God preserves, God protects his kids. Right? Just, you've got to see that here. No one can snatch them out of my hands. And he says here that they are, if they're in the sheepfold, if they're part of the sheep, then God is protecting them. Look at verse 4. He brings out his own sheep. He goes before them. And the, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Now, just it is. it looks weird to watch these shepherds. And here they're going in front of the sheep. And they are just walking, and the entire, all the sheep are following. And if they're on the street, they'll go right down in, 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 uh, in Old Town, Jerusalem. Right there on the, some of the main roads. And you'll see them, and they will walk. Here's the road, and there's a little, like a footpath so there. And they will all stay on that path. They're not, they're not wandering down the road. It's really weird how these sheep are so trained to follow right behind the shepherd. He's the one that's leading such a cool imagery here that, that God has given us. It says here, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him. Notice this, verse 4, for they know his voice. Lord, help us to hear your voice. Yet they will. Now look what it says in verse 5. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. That is important right there. They have learned the voice of God. They do not follow a stranger. It is amazing to me that so many people will follow after false things. I, I don't know. This is a struggle. This is a big struggle to watch people that are very intelligent in a lot of things. And yet when it comes to things, the most important about who is God, what has he revealed to us, they will not investigate it at all. Don't confuse me with the facts. I have a testimony. Every group has a testimony. Well, I have a, I have a feeling. I prayed about it, and I have this feeling. Really, are you going to go by that? My Bible tells me this, that the heart is desperately wicked above all things, and who can know it? My Bible says I am not to trust my heart. My Bible says that we are to do this. We are to test all things, hold fast, that which is good. We are to test it. Someone says, well, I just want you to pray about it and see if you get a feeling. You know what? That's, that's, that's not good. Let me tell you what is good. Know what you believe. Know what you believe. And here's the awesome thing about following God. Because when you have a faith that's built on the facts of who God is, then the feelings come. That did not, it was, it was those on the road to Emmaus that Jesus, and, and, and when Jesus raised from the dead, there was two that was going home after the, it was after the crucifixion. They didn't know about the resurrection. They're going home and they're all, they're all torn up about this. And Jesus shows up to them and he began to tell them, explain to them what was going on. And they said this, did not our hearts burn within us when he shared with us the scriptures? And then you get this burning in the bosom thing that gets, that gets perverted because that was a good thing. Was it not was it not something that was so great when God showed up? But you don't stand on that. That's the benefit of standing on the facts of who God is through his word. Investigate it. Investigate what you believe. Again, it's very difficult sometimes when you got people that just will not invest. What did your founder say? 
Who was he really? Get past the rhetoric. Get past the moving target of the thing that, that says every generation we change our cult a little bit to make it more palatable to that group. And so now we're, you know, and it's a moving target. It's one of those things that just keeps the shape and mold. That's, no, it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Word of God does not change. And so you go back to the Word. What does the Bible say? What does the Word of God say? Well, I don't trust the Bible. The Bible's been mistranslated. Well, good. Okay, cool, cool. Start right there. Start right there. Start right where you're at. Can you trust the Bible? Now, here's what happens. You either hit the, I'm going to do some examination and check this, or you hit the, I'm a lazy, slothful believer in whatever comes along person. Right? You liking me now? Okay. <laughs> Right. Well, because that's, that's the thing. Because you say, you're going to say, well, I don't, believe, I don't believe the Bible is accurate. Really. Tell me what one investigation you've done to discover that. Won't you take that? Okay, let's do this. Let's just start with some of the basics. Start with the archaeology of the Bible. Okay, there's all kinds of cities there. There's all kinds of, there's all kinds of descriptions of, of Bible lands. Can you trust? Let's just do this. Can you trust the, the, the history of the Bible? Start right there. Is there a Jericho? Did it fall? Can you examine it and see what the Bible story says gives us specific details? There is a city called Jericho. There is some very high walls. The, the children of God marched around it, blew the trumpet, the walls fell. Can you find a city in Jer in Jerusalem, right outside of Jerusalem, Jericho. It's got to be in the geographical place too. That's important because it's got to be near the Jordan because they crossed over a Jordan, crossed over the river. When it has to be near there, is there a city that's there where the walls have fallen, where there is a burn layer? In other words, when you begin to excavate, you're going to see an, you're going to see a black layer, and this is where that town was completely fired, completely destroyed by fire, because that's what it says. Is do you find that in Jericho? You find that exact thing, the exact thing that the Bible says. In fact, we learn some things. These it says in the Bible that when the, when the walls fell, they went straight up into the city. Okay, whatever. They just went in the city. No, they went straight up into the city. When they excavated, when the walls fell, and the walls fell, these huge massive walls. And, okay, so you got, here's you down here. Okay, that's you. That's, that's the size of you, okay? Here's the wall right here. Okay, how are you going to get above that wall? When the wall fell, it made a ramp. Now they went straight up into the city, exactly as the Word of God says. So when they excavate, they find ramps going up into the city. They go, wow, that's kind of strange. Look how these walls fell. Yeah, exactly as the way the Bible says. Now take that and go wander around Israel, any area of Israel. You find exactly the same. Hazor is another town. It says that in, in, um, in the book of Joshua, it says they, they completely destroyed Hazor. As you look there, what do you find? Massive city. This was a huge city. What do you find? A, a major burn layer. What does that date to? The time of Joshua. On and on and on it goes. Can you trust us? So you'll find out very quickly. Yes, the stories are accurate. That's that's what's being said. All right. Can I? How do I trust this as as God's word? Now let's. Okay. So we'll set that aside. Now let's 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 do this. The Bible is filled. There's thousands not hundreds, thousands of prophecies in the Bible. Prophecies. This, thus saith the Lord, this is going to happen. All right, so let's go there. Let's look at the prophecies. Let's lay these prophecies out and see if any of these prophecies failed over and over and over again. Prophecy so clear that, 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 that those that would criticize the Bible say, it, these past, Daniel's a good example. Daniel must have been written far after the days of Daniel because um, it's too accurate. There's too many prophecies and they're too accurate about who was going to come, what kingdom was going to come, Alexander the Great, all the things that was going to take place. He is specific, even given names of people that, 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 that would not even be born for another 150 years. How can that happen? And then they find the Dead Sea Scrolls, and then they, that, that puts the rest, all of those critics that say, you know, this was written much later, or messed with by, you know, and on and on it goes. Well, I can't just trust the Bible. No, say it straight. You are, you are intellectually lazy. 
Let me just say it that way. You're intellectually lazy. Because when you do the study of the Bible, you find that it's accurate. I gotta keep going, I'm running out of time. But here's the thing. Try it with other literature. All right, let me just really, let me just really tick somebody off. You only came, a lot of people only come to Calvary Chapel one time. Uh, <laughs> Let me do this, but, I, but I, I'm going to tell you, let me say, before I say this, let me say this to you. Never get mad at me, get even. All right? Don't get mad at me, get even. All right? I mean, try to do that. I'm going to encourage you. Do that with the Bible. Start right there, the Bible. Can I trust the Bible? Go into some of the, some of the things I just said about how do you begin to investigate the Bible. Take the Book of Mormon and do exactly the same thing. Can you trust the archaeology of the Book of Mormon? And do it without, without the, hitting, the, hitting the, the blank stare look. I have a testimony. I don't confuse me with the facts. I have a testimony. And let me tell you, this came up so much that the Smithsonian Institute had to deal with it because they kept being asked, why don't you have a display of the history from the Book of Mormon talking about the peoples of America and all things? Why don't you have a display of that? Smithsonian had to come out with, with a, a couple page document with point after point of why the Book of Mormon is not accurate. And they had, this is not a Christian group. This is not an anti-Mormon group. This is a group saying, look, we have to deal with this because we get this constantly. And it's all over. This is, this is from the Smithsonian saying, look, let's just go through, first of all, the archaeology of the Bible. Let's look at the coinage of the Bible. You say this, this was the, 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 the monetary system during, in, in your story. Doesn't work. Let's look at the animals that you're talking about. Doesn't work. Let's talk about the food products that you're talking about. Doesn't work. On and on and on it goes. Now, again, that, I, I say that. I know some people are starting to get a little, little antsy right now. All right, but I'm saying this because you need to know what you believe. Someday, Jesus Christ is going to return. And it's not going to work for you saying, well, I followed this or that. Do you really know him? Do you really have a relationship with him? Don't be lazy. Know what you believe and why you believe it. Disprove all of this. I encourage you to take that Smithsonian letter. It's all over the internet. Call the Smithsonian and get a copy directly from them. The thing is this. I encourage you to, to take that and disprove it. Say, you know what? You guys are out to lunch. Go after it. I mean, come on. All right, enough, Pastor. Okay. Aren't you glad you brought your neighbors today? You know? No. Oh. But Lord, help us to say these things in love. Really, help us to say these things love. I don't know. This is a hard place to live. This is our place to live. Because how do you say those things? How do you say those kind of things and, and, uh, and do it in love where people are here? I don't know. Lord, help us. But let me say this to you guys. Christians, listen. The minute we start mocking, they quit listening. And so do we. The minute they start mocking our Jesus or our Bible, we quit listening, don't we? Lord, help us. We're doing this about 30% right. Help us to do that better. Got a long ways to go. Now, Jesus used these illustrations. Look at verse 6. It's always safe to just go back to Jesus. Jesus used this illustration, but they did, they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Now, for these guys, and we've seen this already, the reason is, is because of their self-righteousness has blinded them. You know, they just did not want to hear and so they're not going to listen. And so they don't hear. They listen. They look right past. And this is the hard thing to see in this because these are religious people. And could they not see this man that was born blind, this person that had never walked and Jesus is healed, this person, that, the person that was dead, the, 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 the widow's son in Nain that Jesus raised from the dead. Could not they rejoice with the families? Man, this is great joy. The person that was filled with leprosy, advanced stages of, advanced stages of leprosy, and Jesus healed that person. Could they not rejoice? He says here, well, I still got a lot to cover. Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Again, laying over the, the, the threshold so that he, there's protection that's there. One of the I am statements for you that are tracking with that. The I am statements out of John's gospel. There's seven of them. Seven clear ones, and then there's, there's several others, but, but seven I am statements in John. Um, verse 8. All who ever come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. The sheep did not hear them. 
I want to hear the master's voice. Look at verse 9. I am the door. He who enters, notice here, who enters by me. There's only one way to heaven. That's through what Jesus Christ has done. Who enters by me. Notice here, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. In other words, there's a, now you can relax. You go in and out. There's a freedom that's there. There is a, there is a, a pasture that's there. That's the idea of just resting. In this world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. You know, if you follow him, uh, he, he says that there's coming to me, all you are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you what? I'll give you rest. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. Look at verse 10. For I have come that they may have life and, and to have it more abundantly. There's the difference right there. The enemy has come to steal, to kill, to destroy. But what God has done is I've come that they would have life. And that more than expected, abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Now, a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. But I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. I am not going to leave you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And that's the promise he's making. When things get tough... God is there in the difficulties. It's really, and though I've said it, I think all of us said it that follow God for very long. God, where were you? Where were you when this happened? Where were you when this tragedy took place? Where were you on September 11th? Where were you when, when this person died or this, this little baby that we're doing the funeral for died? Where were you? He was there all the time. He says, the other is, they'll flee. He says, but the good shepherd, huh? -uh, he's there with the sheep. When you were crying, he was crying. Thank you, God, for walking with us through this life. The Father knows me even, so I know the Father, and I have laid down my life for the sheep. Verse 16 is one that gets so twisted. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and what? We'll, and will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. When you study the Bible, it is always this, context, context, context. What is the context of what he is saying? Guys, listen, I can take verses out of the Bible, and I can prove any point that I want to prove. I can prove, I can prove all kinds of where I can prove that there's aliens from other planets and they're in spaceships. All you gotta do is pull out a context and without looking at the whole context of what Ezekiel's saying. I saw a wheel within a, a wheel and it's coming down. You know, and I, this whole thing. Then you can do I could I could do this whole thing about aliens and God really is an alien. And I can do this whole thing by pulling certain verses out of the context of the Bible and prove my point. So you gotta be careful in that. Context. In other words, you always want to see what is being said here. Who is it being said to? What is he talking about? Other sheep. He's talking about the Gentiles. It's the Jews and the Gentiles. These two have been at odds with one another from the very beginning, and it was not so. God did not mean it to be that way. He meant Israel, the Jews, to be a light to the Gentiles, that they would know God. They would know God through what God was doing with, with the nation of Israel. And you see that consistently through the word. And there is those two groups in the Bible. We hit it all over the place. We're talking about the life of Christ, the Jews and the Gentiles. And yet God's heart was that there is no Jews or Gentiles or male or female. We're all one in Christ. You ever heard that? Yeah, Apostle Paul would teach us that. And so when he says, I have another sheep that's not of this fold, he's not talking about the Americas. He's not talking about some of these other things. He's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. Now for them, this is anathema. This is crazy talk. You know, they mean you have other sheep. These Gentiles, they're not going to be part of the family. Even the early church struggled with this. In the book of Acts, they struggled with the Gentiles coming in to, to know God. They just didn't, they, they struggled with that. There my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Look at verse 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. 
not a power to lay it down, I have power to take it up again. This commandment I have received from my Father. No one's taken my life, I lay it down, preparing them for what's coming. Therefore there is a division among the Jews because of this saying. And many of them says, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, they are not the words of those who has a demon. Can a demon uh, open the eyes of the blind? Division, struggles. How can this man be who he says he is? Why are you listening to him? All the little murmurings of the crowd as he's speaking. Those things are still the same today. But they were looking and longing for the coming of Messiah. Every prophecy that they, they had known, especially the Jews, they had memorized these things. Every prophecy about Messiah was being fulfilled right before their eyes and they were blinded to it. Make sure you know him. Make sure you're spending time getting to know him. Just turn off that stupid television. Get away from some of those things that are just foolish. And open your Bible and begin to read. You know so much about so many things. We had a good, um, years ago, had uh, um, one of, uh, it was um, Pentecost was his last name. Pentecost was at a church I was at. And, and we're talking about the, son, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's a theologian from Dallas Theological Seminary. Dwight Pentecost was a theologian and, and a guy knows about Bible prophecy. We're talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Yeah, it was a little break time. We're all out there and we're talking about the, there was some big sports thing going on then. We're all talking about the sports thing. And uh, he came back. I never forgot this. He came back and rebuked us for that. He said, y'all, we've been talking about the coming of the Lord. Been in our Bibles and looking at this great blessed hope that we have of him coming. And all you can talk about is this stupid sports game. Is that what you're all focused about? I never forgot that because we should be talking about and, and living and, and, and longing for the coming of the Lord. We ought to be students of the word, not distracted into the, all the garbage of this world. We ought to be students of the world, of, of the word. And the thing is this, when someone says, well, you can't trust the Bible, you ought to have an answer for that. You ought to be able to talk to them about archeology, span about languages, about what, what languages is the Bible originally written in? Do you know that? Do you know it's not just, it's just not two. There's three languages that it was originally penned in. Do you know some of the Old Testament was not penned in Hebrew? What is that all about? Right in the middle of chapters, it changes languages in the original text. Why does it do that? Do you know these things? Some of these things are important for us. Well, why would that be important to me? Well, you need him. You need to know him. Because when I came to faith in Jesus Christ, he gave me a hunger for his word. And I will not be lied to. If the Bible is true, then I'll follow him. And if, if it is not true, I will not. If I went over to Israel and found out that Jericho did not fall the way that the Bible says, that Jericho stood, stood for generation after generation, was never conquered, or any of these things, I wouldn't be a Christian. I wouldn't, I, mean, I wouldn't be a follower of God. Because if he can't preserve his word, and he cannot be accurate with the word of God, then, I can't, then why would I want to trust him? He's incompetent then. But if it is true then I've got to, make a, I've got to make a decision. Am I going to follow him and I going to, am I going to learn from him? You've got to make that decision. 